So I'd like to start by thanking the Physiological Society for awarding me the Otto Hutter Teaching Prize for 2014 and for giving me the opportunity uh, of presenting this talk, which I've titled Engaging Students and Valuing Teachers. So if we start thinking about uh, engaging students, what do we mean by the term engaging students? There's been quite a lot of work in the literature on this subject, uh, and there's a, a good review by Trowler uh, from 2010, in which she divides the process of engaging students into three different dimensions. Firstly, she talks about the behavioural dimension of engagement. So that relates to students' attendance at teaching sessions and their participation in class. And that can be evaluated by recording attendance sheets uh, and by observing students during the class. The second dimension of engagement is the emotional dimension. So to what extent are students interested in their learning? Are they enjoying a teaching session? Are they enthusiastic about it? Or are they just turning up, going through the motions, um, but not really engaging uh, on an emotional level? with the teaching that's being provided. And that can be evaluated through, for example, student feedback. And then finally, there's the gold standard dimension of engagement, the cognitive dimension. Are students actually learning something as a result of the teaching that's provided? And one way of evaluating that is to evaluate test or exam results. And student engagement is generally seen as being a joint responsibility between students who have to engage in their learning, teachers who need to provide teaching in an engaging way, and also the host university that needs to provide the appropriate facilities for that teaching to be delivered. Now, these days, I think there are a number of challenges in terms of engaging students in their learning. For a start, students are paying a lot of money for their attendance at university with the increased student tuition fees. And I think that this has slightly changed the climate within universities in the last few years, in that students feel more like consumers than they used to. And there's certainly a small minority, I would say, but nevertheless a, a finite group of students who believe that because they're paying a lot of money for their education, they don't really need to do that much, and teachers should simply provide them with the information that they need. Then we have increased student numbers and a more diverse student population. There are certainly many more students at university these days than there were 10, 15 years ago. And because widening participation activities have been so successful, they have a more diverse range of prior learning experiences. So we have the challenge of delivering teaching, which is appropriate to a wide range of different students. It's generally agreed that it's difficult to engage students in large group teaching sessions like lectures, uh, that it's easier to engage them in small group teaching and, for example, in lab-based practical work. But both small group teaching and lab-based practical work is very resource intensive. This is a, a photograph of our physiology teaching lab in action. And you can see it's a very busy place. We have a lot of staff acting as demonstrators in practical classes, and we have a lot of expensive equipment. So whereas small group teaching and lab-based practical teaching can be very effective, it is very resource intensive. And the final challenge uh, that I want to talk about is the increasing pressure from students taking professional programmes and also the relevant regulatory bodies to emphasise the clinical application of medical science teaching. So basic science should, should theoretically be delivered in a clinical context where it's very clear what the clinical relevance of that teaching is. And that can be difficult for teachers, for example, like me. I don't have a clinical qualification and I'm sure that there are many other people teaching basic medical science who are in the same situation. 
So the first example that I'd like to talk about is um, a type of teaching that we've been developing at Bristol, which aims to address these two challenges here. The problem of engaging students in large group teaching sessions, and also this increasing pressure to deliver medical science teaching in a clinical context. So these are large group cross-disciplinary sessions which incorporate e-voting uh, using Ask the Audience clickers, which I know have been around for several years, but we're using them in a slightly uh, novel way. So these are sessions attended by all of our second year cohort of medical students, so 250 students in a lecture theatre, and it's team teaching which is delivered by a GP, a hospital physician, and a physiologist. And the remit of these sessions is to develop diagnostic reasoning skills within the students, but placing a very heavy emphasis on the importance of them understanding the underlying physiology and pathophysiology in order to reach a diagnosis. Each session follows the diagnostic journey for a central patient. It highlights the relevant physiology and pathophysiology, and also the scientific rationale for any clinical tests that are performed. And we also introduce additional pop-up patients who have similar symptoms to the central patient, but for a different underlying pathophysiology. And this starts the students thinking about the process of differential diagnosis. So this is a typical timeline for a two-hour session. And I've color-coded the timeline according to what type of activity is happening during the session. So the green blocks represent the general practitioner leading the session. The yellow blocks represent some type of student interaction. So they might be e-voting, they might be uh, doing some role play, they might be brainstorming in relation to a problem that we've set them. The blue blocks represent the hospital physician perspective, and the red blocks represent the underpinning physiology. And you can see that there's a lot of changes in tempo throughout the two-hour session, um, and it's quite a dynamic session with lots of different things going on. And you'll see this timeline actually playing out at the top of each of the slides that I'm going to use now. So I'm just going to talk about one typical session in which the GP starts the session, so we're on the green block here, introducing the patient. And in this situation, uh, this particular session, he's called Dave. He's a newly registered patient. His medical records are in transit. And all he can tell the GP is that he's been on medication for diabetes for 15 years. So the session then goes on to perform some urinalysis, which is performed by a pair of students. So a typical test that would be done by a GP in that situation. So we have a couple of students come out to the front. We make this uh, a bit theatrical, and they put on their plastic aprons, and they wear their specs and uh, plastic gloves. And we would have prepared <clears throat> a sample of urine beforehand for them to test. And that sample of urine contains blood, glucose, and protein. And we can project the results of the neuroanalysis, the dipstick, using a visualizer on the large screen so that all the students can see the outcome of that urinalysis. So the students then brainstorm possible diagnoses for Dave. So we ask them to call out what would be the sort of diagnosis that the GP might be thinking about, given that urinalysis and what Dave has already told them. So the students come up with a range of options, um, usually including acute kidney injury, um, chronic renal disease, uh, urinary tract infection, possibly cancer. Uh, and we write those up on the board. And we have prepared an e-voting slide which lists those different conditions. So we then produce the first um, voting slide, and the students vote on Dave's most likely diagnosis from 
nine potential clinical conditions. And we use this voting slide, the same voting slide, throughout the session. So this is the results of the vote that happened in the cohort of students that uh, received this session this year. This was the first time that they voted. Now, the correct diagnosis that we're working towards is option two, and option five would also be plausible. But the students, and indeed the GP, don't have enough information at the moment to make that diagnosis. So, as you can see, there's a fairly wide spread of the way the students are thinking diagnostically. We then reveal some more information about Dave. So, the GP does a physical examination, which shows that he has raised blood pressure, and he also has pitting ankle edema. So the students vote again on Dave's diagnosis, and you can see that there's a bit of a shift in the profile with this additional information. They're taking that on board and they're factoring that in and making their votes. But we're still not really getting very many of them getting towards um, option two, which is entirely understandable. Then we have a physiology section uh, where we talk about factors involved in fluid movement across capillary walls, so colloid osmotic pressure, hydrostatic pressure, and what are the different pathophysiological causes of edema? So kidney disease, congestive heart failure, liver disease, malnutrition. So this would be revision for the students. They would have covered this all already uh, in lectures, but this is getting them to think about it in a very clinically relevant situation. The physician then introduces two pop-up patients that the students vote on. And these two pop-up patients both have pitting ankle edema, but for a very different underlying pathophysiology from our central patient, Dave. And the students are given the clinical scenario for those two patients, and they vote for those two patients on the same voting slide as they've been voting on for Dave. We then go back to Dave, and the students vote for the third time on Dave, and they now have quite a lot of additional information. Uh, they're able to look at Dave's clinical picture in relation to two other patients. And this is the third voting profile from Dave, and you can see that we now have actually more than 70% of the students are making either the correct or a very plausible diagnosis. So the student feedback on these sessions is, is very good. They really enjoy having the physiology provided to them in a clinical context, um, and they find that it, it helps them very much to link physiology with clinical presentations. So thinking about Trowler's three dimensions of engagement, we're certainly ticking the behavioral aspect. They certainly all attend, they all bring their clickers along, um, and they certainly participate. The student feedback shows that they're enjoying the session, uh, that they're interested in it. And there is evidence that they're also achieving learning because they're incorporating the new information which is provided to them into the voting profile that they, that they make. So this is a large group session that emphasizes clinical application of basic anatomy and physiology. And the principle could be applied across a wide range of topics and different student groups. So I'd now like to consider another example where we are addressing the challenge of lab-based practical work being resource intensive. And I'd like to illustrate this by talking about the way we've introduced our virtual microscope or digital microscopy for teaching histology. And this happened back in 2007 to 8. Now, I'm aware that not all physiology departments teach histology. We, we do in Bristol. But hopefully this will provide some interesting material that would be relevant to a lot of different practical um, scenarios. So the background to this is that we provide histology teaching for nearly a thousand students each year across the medical, dental and veterinary programs. And before 2007 that teaching was based only on light microscopes. It didn't enjoy 
fantastic student feedback. Um, a lot of students found it hard, they found it difficult using the microscopes. They got very tired looking down a microscope for two to three hours, and they found it quite boring. It was resource intensive for staff. We used to have a lot of demonstrators there helping the students to focus the microscopes, focus the condenser and so on, as well as actually helping them look at the material. Uh, the sessions lacked peer interaction. It's quite lonely looking down your own light microscope. Nobody else can see what you can see. Uh, and the students didn't really talk to each other very much. And the students lacked opportunities for revision and formative feedback. So the only way they could do revision was to come back into the teaching lab, uh, and that was difficult to organise outside timetable teaching. And they didn't receive any formative feedback on how well they were understanding the material. So in 2007, we scanned about 500 of our glass-mounted tissue sections, and we created an online archive or database of digital images. And many of those were annotated by staff. So this is a typical histology practical class as they run now. Each student still has access to their own light microscope. And you can see the student in the foreground here is, is using his light microscope. But he also has access to digital images through the virtual microscope. The students also access digital images from the VM in pairs. So we have a pair of students accessing the same material on the front bench here and this bench here has got a pair of students, again, working together. So the class starts off with a brief introduction by the class lead. And the students use both digital and glass-mounted histology slides and also some histopathology material to work through exercises in a paper handbook. Now, importantly, the students can annotate the slides and also record their own notes on their own VM account. So each student has a private VM account, which they access via a password, and they can annotate slides and record notes that they can then access later on and use for their own revision. And we have demonstrators available to provide individual guidance as needed, but not as many as we used to need when the students were using only light microscopes. And during and after a histology practical class, the students can access formative quiz questions. So this is a, a section through the thyroid gland. You can see that it's been annotated with circles and arrows. And on the left of the slide are some typical quiz questions that the students would answer online. So the first question is, which encircled area corresponds to tissue responsible for the regulation of blood calcium? And an important point here is that we do teach histology very much with a physiological context. So we try and make a lot of structure function links in our histology teaching. The students then get instant formative feedback on whether they got the question right, uh, and they can access these quizzes at any stage after the practical. So thinking about Trowler's three dimensions of engagement, first of all, the behavioural dimension. So this is the change in student behaviour which has happened since the first year that we introduced the virtual microscope, 2007 to 8, and the change in behaviour that happened about three years later. So these graphs show the percentage of student VM accounts that were accessed a given number of times during the year. So the blue bars represent VM accounts that were accessed less than 10 times during the year. The black bars represent VM accounts that were accessed more than 30 times in the year. And you can see that there's quite a change in profile between those two years. So the virtual microscope is becoming much more embedded into teaching. Students are accessing it on a much more regular basis now and they're finding it a valuable tool in their histology learning. Another aspect of behavioural engagement, this is a question that was asked around 200 second year medical students in uh, 2014. For how many hours would you typically study material on the VM in the week before a histology practical class? Well, not very much really. 
In the week after a histology practical class, getting better, and in the week before a histology exam, uh, almost a complete reversal of uptake. So 30% of students are accessing the VM for more than five hours in the week before a histology exam. So clearly their use of the VM for histology revision is, is quite uh, intensive. This year we've actually introduced pre-lab quizzes which students need to um, finish to complete before they come along to a histology practical. Uh, so we're predicting that they will actually access the VM significantly more before a histology practical class than they have done up until now. Um, and that histogram might look rather different uh, if we repeated it next year. And they will also come along much better prepared for the histology practical class. So the emotional dimension of engagement this is, again, student feedback taken from 2012, medical students again. So they're learning during histology practical classes. They feel it benefits more from using the VM than the light microscope. And they find the histology revision quizzes are helpful for their learning. So what about the final dimension of engagement, the cognitive dimension? So this graph illustrates the average grades in the histology component of the exam, the end of year exam, for three of our student cohorts who do histology. So first year medical students, first year vet students and second year vet students. And I haven't included second year medical students or first year dental students because other things changed during that period of time. Whereas the only thing that changed for these three cohorts of students was the introduction of the virtual microscope. And you can see that actually their performance in exams has not changed significantly as a result of introducing the virtual microscope. But we would argue that the type of exam that we can deliver now is actually rather more challenging in that we can assess the students on a much wider range of material than we could previously. Previously, students would really only look at one or possibly two slides in the histology lab, they would need to draw some diagrams and answer some questions on those slides. But now we can ask them questions on a large range of different material. So although their performance hasn't changed, we feel that that is actually an indication that um, their performance across the board has certainly been maintained and is probably a lot more comprehensive than might have been the case before. So, trial has three dimensions of engagement. The student's behaviour suggests that they're engaging with the virtual microscope. Their feedback suggests that they are interested and they enjoy using it. The jury's out on the cognitive side, but um, they're certainly being assessed on a wider range of material and they're performing just as well as they did previously. It's certainly much less resource intensive now delivering histology teaching. The students get formative feedback through the quiz questions and they can also have peer assisted learning in that because they're working in pairs, they talk to each other, they support each other during classes and they discuss the material that they're looking at on the screen. And the introduction of some histopathology slides also means that we're beginning to introduce some clinical application. Right, so turning now to the last part of the talk, uh, valuing teachers, and I want to go back now to 2010, when two quite influential reports were published. The one on the left was produced by the Academy of Medical Sciences, and the one on the right was produced by the Higher Education Academy in collaboration with the Gini Centre for Excellence in Teaching and Learning, which is based at the University of Leicester. And both these reports address the status and valuation of teaching in higher education. And they highlighted the disparity between achievements in research versus achievements in teaching in contributing to career progression in higher education. The following year, in 2011, the government produced a white paper on higher education in England 
students at the heart of the system, in which they also highlighted the fact that they wanted there to be a renewed focus on high quality teaching in universities so that it has the same prestige as research, and that various proposals in the white paper would result in universities concentrating on high quality teaching and staff earning promotion for teaching ability rather than research alone. So this was quite a good indication that the government were also concerned about recognising teaching in higher education. And the Academy of Medical Sciences in 2010, their report had included 12 recommendations. And I've just listed three of them here. Establishing transparent strategies through which teaching is allocated to staff. Providing staff with transparent information about the financial return from both teaching and research. Feedback from the sector had suggested that there was very little transparency in both those processes. And that there should be a greater emphasis on recognising and celebrating teaching achievements through the award of prizes um, and also through career progression. So in 2011, we decided to carry out a survey within the Physiological Society to see to what extent those recommendations from the Academy of Medical Sciences had been actually implemented within universities. So this was a survey that we carried out through the education and teaching theme in the summer of 2011. And we targeted usually one representative in each university in which there were members of the Physiological Society. Usually it was the society rep, sometimes it was somebody in the education and teaching theme. We had a pretty good response rate. We had 53 respondents who between them represented 46 universities across the UK drawn from a range of mission groups. And I'll show you the data from that survey in a moment. But the bottom line was that it didn't look like there had been very good progress in implementing the recommendations in the Academy of Medical Sciences report. So I contacted the chair of the steering group who had produced the Academy of Medical Sciences report and suggested that maybe we should get together. So in autumn 2013, we carried out a joint project with the Academy of Medical Sciences and also the Society of Biology, and we repeated the online survey. At this time, we were able to target a much wider range of respondents. Uh, we had 270 respondents who represented quite a wide range of career profile uh, and also a reasonably wide range of points in their career. And this second survey produced results from 65 institutions across the UK, again drawn from a range of mission groups. So I'll just show you some of the data from those two surveys. So the circle on the left will always represent the results from the 2011 survey. So the figures represent the number of respondents in each of those categories. And the one on the right will always represent the data from 2013. So in response to the question, the strategy by which teaching is allocated to staff in my department stroke school is transparent to all academic staff. Well, in neither of those surveys did staff agree that that was the case. More than 50% said that that wasn't correct. Individual teaching contributions of staff are made available to all academic staff. So we're again talking about transparency here. Well, no, in neither survey did the majority of staff feel that that was the case. Uh, in 2013, about two thirds of staff said that that was not correct. Are staff provided with transparent information about the financial return from teaching? Well, no. Again, about two-thirds of staff in 2013 uh, said that that wasn't the case. Interestingly, those proportions were reversed when the same question was asked in relation to income from research. And then finally, is promotion to professor possible on the basis of achievements in teaching and learning? Well, by far the largest response rate in both the surveys to that question was for the answer, that's true in theory, 
but in practice, such promotions are rare as teaching and research are not seen as being equivalent. So the summary of the situation at the end of 2013 was that some progress had been made in relation to the award of institutional teaching fellowships and prizes. I didn't show you the data for that, but we were reasonably encouraged by progress in that area. But serious issues remained in relation to transparency, both in terms of teaching-related allocation and also income generated by teaching, and in relation to parity of esteem between teaching and research in career progression. So what's happened since then? Well, in 2014, we hosted a joint workshop in March. So that was a joint uh, collaboration by the Academy of Medical Sciences, the Physiological Society, the Society of Biology, and the Higher Education Academy. And the aim was to raise the profile of teaching and to share good practice. And we had invited participants, some pretty senior participants. We had representation from Hefke. We had uh, attendance by a number of vice chancellors and pro vice chancellors, deans, staff from university, HR and personnel departments, and representation from learned societies and a wide range of academic staff. And during that workshop, we had some plenary sessions to try and share good practice that was going on in the sector. And we also had workshops for brainstorming thoughts uh, as to how the situation could be improved. And in June, we published a report from that workshop and also um, the results of the survey. And that report was launched in, in Physiology 2014 last year. We had very good press release, pr uh, good press coverage as a result of that um, report and workshop. And the situation was covered by The Guardian, um, by The Times, and also The Times Higher. And in December last year, we had a letter published by the Times Higher Education, again highlighting this discrepancy in, between teaching and research in terms of career progression. We did have some measure of success in 2014. I don't know how many of you are familiar with this publication, The Essential Guide to Moving Up the Academic Career Ladder. Uh, but in April 2014, that contained the block of text shown on the left there, which I will leave you to read. And that was changed as a result of our feedback in May 2014 to the text on the right. which hopefully you'll agree is a significant improvement. Now, during this year, there have been a number of national reports and publications uh, that are relevant to this general area. In March, the Royal Academy of Engineering published a report entitled Does Teaching Advance Your Academic Career? Um, and they carried out online surveys and focus groups and actually came to exactly the same conclusions that had been the case for the original Academy of Medical Sciences report and the surveys that we had carried out in 2011 and 2013. So one of their conclusions from their survey was that there's a widespread perception that teaching is undervalued in university promotion and reward procedures. And they came up with a number of recommendations. I've listed three of them here. Improve the transparency of promotion de decisions. So again, that word transparency. Develop a robust set of measures to demonstrate teaching achievement and improve the support offered to candidates for teaching-based promotion. So there's evidence there from another part of the higher education sector that things need to change. The Conservative Party manifesto in April, as I'm sure many of you will know, included this statement. Uh, we will ensure that universities deliver the best possible value for money to students. 
we will introduce a framework to recognise universities offering the highest teaching quality. And that has sent a little frisson around the uh, higher education sector. Is this uh, a warning that a teaching excellence framework, something equivalent to REF, might be introduced by the government? Very recently, the Higher Education Academy and the Higher Education Policy Institute have published their joint student academic experience survey for 2014. Uh, that had over 15,000 students responded. And one of the findings there was that 39% of the students who responded felt that the most important characteristic of a lecturer is that they have training to teach and that this was uh, significantly more important than they have current research involvement. So the pressure is mounting to increase recognition for high quality teaching. So other physiological society initiatives that we currently have in the pipeline, Chrissy Stokes and I are currently producing a booklet recognizing teachers in the life sciences, which includes case studies of academic staff for whom educational achievements have played a significant part in their career progression. So this isn't simply teaching focused staff, it includes case studies for staff who have maintained bench research uh, as well as delivering excellent teaching, but have been rewarded for that educational achievement in their pathway um, to senior positions. So that booklet we are hoping uh, will provide informative and inspiring role models for people, examples of good practice, we hope to distribute it to university senior management and also HR departments. And it will also include sections on guidance on developing a career based in, on teaching. Saranjit Sahota uh, in the Physiological Society is um, putting together fringe events at the Labour and the Conservative Party conferences in the autumn. So these fringe events will be lunchtime events entitled Higher Expectations, Who Cares About Teaching in HE. Uh, we're collaborating on that with the cross-party think tank Demos, and the panel discussions will be aiming to highlight the issue of recognition for teaching with politicians, with journalists, and other stakeholders. And the panel of speakers at those fringe events is likely to include parliamentarians, journalists, and also representatives drawn from the society, uh, from the Russell Group, from the National Union of Students, uh, from HEPI, and from relevant trade unions. And finally, we're working with the Society of Biology, with input from the Academy of Medical Sciences, to develop a document which will be a framework for an evidence portfolio that people could put together to support a case for promotion based on teaching. So a steering group for that project has been identified. And examples of evidence within the framework could include professional recognition, uh, feedback from students and peers, what somebody has done in terms of developing and disseminating innovative teaching, mentoring provided and CPD undertaken, teaching prizes and awards, um, publications uh, in an educational area, and income generation. Those, those are just examples of the sort of evidence that people who want to base a case for promotion on teaching really need to be thinking about gathering. And we would be looking to produce that framework to illustrate examples at the different stages of career progression. So you would need to put together a different type of portfolio to progress, say, from a lecturer to a senior lecturer, compared with someone who's looking to be promoted to a professor in teaching and learning. So finally, acknowledgements. Um, I'd like to acknowledge a number of people. In terms of the student engagement part of the talk, uh, the multidisciplinary e-voting sessions, I'd like to acknowledge three of my colleagues at Bristol. Barney Hole and Barbara Lau are both clinicians. Eugene Lloyd, I think many of you will know. In terms of the virtual microscope project, I'd like to acknowledge Margaret Katumu, Max Headley, Phil Langton, and Frankie Macmillan. Again, many of you will know one or all of those. 
um, and also our excellent technical support team. In terms of the status and valuation of teaching project, I'd like to acknowledge huge input and support from Chrissy Stokes. Also input from Dave Lewis, uh, with whom I put together the first 2011 Physiological Society online survey. And also from Blair Grubb, who chairs the Education and Outreach Committee for his support uh, and also for making some resource available to underpin our current projects. So, thank you very much.